reasons. My name is Dan Grazier. I spent 10 years as an officer in the United States Marine Corps, and in my time in the service, including deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, I learned how to evaluate weapons and equipment on their true military value. And as a graduate student of military history at Norwich University at the moment, right down the road in, in, in Northfield, I know that the F-35 program is already a disaster of historical proportions that will only get worse in the future. The Center for Defense Information is a nonpartisan watchdog organization. My predecessors and colleagues have spent decades exposing the waste and abuse that all too often accompanies Pentagon weapons programs. I've spent the past four years studying the F-35 program in great detail, and I can assure you that despite the flood of optimistic press reports emanating from the Pentagon and from industry-funded media outlets, the F-35 remains a deeply flawed program. The F-35 has, from the very beginning, been slated to become a nuclear-capable aircraft. This capability is one that will be added in the $10-plus billion modernization program planned for all new production planes and for already produced Block 3 planes. Our potential adversaries, the nuclear-armed ones, monitor very closely all of our nuclear delivery vehicles. Just as we monitor their activities, they know where we station all of our missiles, submarines, and bombers. It is only prudent to target nuclear assets in the unthinkable event of a nuclear war. That would include any and all F-35 bases to include Burlington. It should be pointed out that the B-61 Mod 12, which is sized specifically for the F-35's bomb bay, has been described as the world's most dangerous nuclear weapon. It is designed to be a variable yield weapon, which means that it can be employed at a maximum yield of 50 kilotons, which is approximately three times the size of the Hir Hiroshima bomb, or dialed back to a 0.3 kiloton yield. And what makes this weapon dangerous is its small yield size, what some people call a tactical or a battlefield nuclear weapon. Imagine a future emergency along the lines of September 11th, with a president under a great deal of pressure to respond strongly in the wake of an attack. As a show of force, the president could deploy Vermont's F-35s to the trouble spot in question. And in response to further tension or provocations, military leaders could tempt the president to use a so-called little nuclear bomb delivered by F-35s to send a message. The trouble with this is that other countries do not distinguish between tactical and strategic nuclear weapons. To them, a nuke is a nuke. If they happen to be aligned with a country targeted by our tactical nuclear weapons, the chances of escalation into a strategic nuclear exchange become very great indeed. I know officials have been claiming that bringing the F-35 to Vermont is important for jobs and the local economy. Just this past week, in a hearing before the House Armed Services Committee, Pentagon officials admitted that it cost at least $44,000 per hour to operate the F-35A, and we have reason to believe that those costs are actually much higher. The F-35 program was designed by Lockheed Martin in such a way that their people can perform, that only their people can perform most of the maintenance of that aircraft. Vermont will likely lose jobs here because the aircraft will have to be sent elsewhere for maintenance operations, or Lockheed Martin contractors will be sent here temporarily to perform work that is traditionally performed by guard personnel. This ensures the company receives lucrative F-35 sustainment contracts throughout the life of the program, contracts that you will have to budget for in part once the 158th fighter wing transitions to the F-35. These high operating costs will not go away over time because they are baked into the system. Pentagon officials talk about all the plans they have to drive down these costs, but also just admitted last week that they are likely to fall far short of their goals in the coming decade. My name is Roger Perez, and I retired Lieutenant Colonel of the United States Air Force and Air National Guard. While in Vermont Air National Guard, my aircraft was scrambled once carrying nuclear armed rockets to investigate an enemy Russian bomber that had penetrated our airspace. By the time we reached the airspace violation, the Russian bomber was back in international airspace. In Maine, I was scrambled twice with the same outcome. Penetrating one another's airspace was a game played by both the Russians and the U.S. to gather intelligence. Given the order, we would have launched our nuclear weapons. Had that ever happened, we would have started a nuclear war. Crew members and ground crews all had top secret clearances and we were not allowed to disclose any information 
about nuclear weapons at DTB to the public. The Department of Defense and the Air Force did not tell the public about our nuclear mission or about the nuclear weapons stored in Burlington. My personal experience with the F-89 nuclear mission leads me to believe that the public will not be told anything should the Air Force decide again to give the Vermont Air Guard a nuclear mission. In other words, we, would, we could again have a nuclear mission without the governor, legislators, and the public knowing about it. Having a master's degree in international relations, I cannot help but be concerned about how many of our international conflicts were initiated by blunders, mistakes, miscalculations, and or failures in our military political system. But there is no safe level of failure when nuclear weapons are involved. Having a nuclear bomber base at the Burlington Airport is an existential threat to Burlington, the Northeast, and to our humanity. Prohibiting the F-35 nuclear delivery system from being based in Vermont means one less possible catastrophe from happening to all of us. My name is Pierre Spray. I started at Grumman Aircraft, working on a number of fighters there and the Navy's small nuclear bomber of the time, the A-6. I went to Washington to work for the Secretary of Defense. I did a study that convinced the Secretary of Defense and the National Security Advisor and the President that what they'd been told about the accuracy of our nuclear weapons was greatly exaggerated. You've been told from various sources, political and military, that we're assured that there will be no nuclear mission coming to Burlington. Uh, that's an empty statement. And let me just start with a very simple piece of history. From the early 60s, when Colonel Barasa was in F-89s and F-101s, and the mission here was nuclear armed intercept of Russian bombers, until today, there have been six changes of mission, none of which Vermont had anything to do with or any say in. They were simply imposed. And none of those were the citizens of Vermont or the legislature consulted. It just happened. And you're facing right now perhaps the momentous, most momentous mission change that's likely to come to Vermont. So let me give you a little background on that. In 1973, the Air Force had made every single seat fighter in the Air Force a nuclear bomber, and that had been true since the late, since the mid 50s. During the 50s, the Army and the Navy invented a bizarre concept called tactical nuclear war. Uh, that is the, fact, the idea that you could fight some small nuclear war in some quarter of Europe or Asia, and it wouldn't spread anywhere. The Air Force, under Truman and Eisenhower, had knocked down this huge portion of the budget for nuclear bombers. And of course, the Army and the Navy weren't going to sit still for that, as you might imagine. And so they invented this thing that there would be these short-range nuclear war, little local deals, and that they would have to develop lots of weapons for that, and of course, collect lots of money for that. The Air Force came back with the idea that they would turn all their small fighters into short-range nuclear bombers to cut into some of that pie of these small nuclear wars. All that was approved by Eisenhower, unfortunately. Uh, and the Air Force, ever since then, from that day to this day, has armed all their, all their first-line single-seat fighters with nuclear wiring to enable them to become small nuclear bombers. This is the background where James Schlesinger steps in. Being a man of conscience, he wanted to leave a legacy of improved weapons behind in the Pentagon. Because he was very versed in nuclear matters, he understood the, the true danger, if not absolute insanity, of arming a single-seat fighter with a nuclear weapon. 
he decided, as I said very early on in his tenure, that he would back the two airplanes that I had worked on, the A-10 and the F-16. They would be his legacy to the Air Force, and he would end this insanity of making every single seat fighter a small nuclear bomber. He offered to expand the Air Force by 1,500 airplanes using the A-10 and the F-16. 1,500 airplanes that they never expected to get. But of course, it's a huge feather in the cap of the Chief of Staff of the Air Force to preside over this major expansion of the Air Force. And he said, one string, you must accept these without putting nuclear wiring on them. Well, the deal was too sweet, and Air Force Chief of Staff, George Brown, signed up, basically signed in blood for the deal in 1973, and they went, went to work on that basis, started producing the airplanes. All that changed suddenly in 1975, when Schlesinger was axed in the Saturday Night Massacre, organized by the now famous uh, Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney. So he was out. Within one week, the Air Force Chief of Staff reneged on his promise and ordered nuclear wiring on the F-16. An enormously consequential decision because it's the reason you got F-16s that have nuclear wiring here in Vermont. And it's the reason that when the, when the first contracts were let to start the F-35 in 1996, the nuclear wiring was baked in. The Air Force never had the slightest doubt that they were going to make this airplane a nuclear capable airplane. In 2018, President Trump and his Secretary of Defense issued a new nuclear posture review. Those are done about every four years to state what the overall nuclear position of the United States is. It now makes the small nuclear war an integral part of the strategic defense of the United States. It says that it's in its essence that there's a seamless ladder of nuclear weapons options from tiny warheads in small regional nuclear wars all the way up to the all-out Holocaust. That report places the F-35 front and center in the strategic defense of the United States because it actually, for the first time ever, it mentions a specific fighter by name, the posture of has never happened before. And in fact, it brings up the F-35 eight times in this report. Very unusual. And of course, there's a reason why. One, of course, is they're trying to justify the unprecedented budget of the F-35. Remember, this is the most expensive weapons program in the history of the world, much more so than, say, the atom bomb, as an example, or the nuclear submarine, or any of that. It also uh, puts the F-35 front and center because it will be the first weapon system deployed with this whole new emphasis on small nuclear weapons. The small weapons are much more dangerous than the big ones because it's easier to envision dropping them. Uh, and that's exactly what the Nuclear Posture Review does. It says we can envision uh, the, the credibility of using small nuclear weapons to settle small regional wars, uh, and we reserve the right to use them first against an enemy who's never used a nuclear weapon against us. It says that very specifically. As Colonel Barraza pointed out, that could be the, a very small weapon could be the beginning of basically the end of the world. And so you, as the Vermont legislature and the people of Vermont, are facing a very, very large issue. Do you really want to be the lead in the, in the all national guard units in the country to house a small nuclear bomber that could be the very first nuclear weapon dropped on another country that never dropped one on us and set off the nuclear holocaust and at the same time turned Vermont into a nuclear target for 
Russians, Chinese, or whatever. What control can we actually uh, extend to the federal government in this regard? Say Vermont says no to uh, wanting our F-35s wired for nuclear capability, for nuclear bombs. How seriously do they take, would they take that? I think it would be of enormous consequence. I mean, and more than symbolic. I think there'd be real legal consequences. And the reason is because, as you know, you know, the services are full of people who have a conscience. And something as momentous as bringing nuclear weapons to Vermont that have been banned here, somebody for sure would leave. Uh, my belief the Air Force would not risk such a thing. Have you ever experienced to say a state saying no to something that the Department of Defense honored? Yes, they have. States have not simply rolled over for everything that the Pentagon wants or the National Guard Bureau in Washington wants. Uh, my name is Roseanne Greco. I served on active duty in the Air Force for 30 years and retired as a full colonel. I was an intelligence officer and I specialized in nuclear weapons and specifically in nuclear weapons targeting. I was also a nuclear weapons arms control negotiator uh, and I was on the delegation of the START, of the Star talks, which we signed, it was START number one. But I find in talking about nuclear weapons, much less nuclear war, that people either don't want to believe it or they are too frightened to even talk about it. We are closer to nuclear war than we have been in the last 30 years. This is because of the reinvigorated push to, quote, modernize our nuclear weapons, the abrogation of nuclear weapons treaties, the increase in the number of nuclear countries, and increased world tensions. And make no mistake, the F-35 is a nuclear weapons system. The Secretary of Defense announced that publicly in his 2018 Nuclear Posture Review. Regardless of any assurances you may hear, I can share with you from my background in nuclear targeting that our enemies will assume that all F-35s are nuclear weapon delivery systems, and as a result, all F-35 bases will be targeted. From a targeting perspective, meaning we are the target, the only thing that matters is what the enemy thinks. The other unimaginable aspect of having F-35s based here is a possibility that the Vermont Air National Guard could one day be called upon to drop a nuclear payload on another part of the world, or even worse, could one day become the instrument for initiating worldwide holocaust. I cannot fathom how Vermonters would stomach that possibility. Any other mission for the Vermont Air Guard is better than this. In Alaska, uh, they were scheduled to get a certain type of aircraft, and the governor, or excuse me, the, the senator spoke up, and the Air Force reversed that. In North Carolina, they were slated to get some, I believe it was F 35s, I'll, I'll, I'll double check her, F 18s. The people spoke up, a grassroots coalition spoke up and threatened to sue, and they reversed it. They never came. In Eglin Air Force Base, they uh, had a lawsuit against the Air Force because of F-35s, and re they reduced the number of F-35s by 50%. Sorry, what in, state is that? That was in Florida. Oh, Eglin. Is, uh, Eglin Air Force Base is in Florida. Um, in uh, North Carolina, in Virginia, and in, um, I think it was Idaho. I will get you all no, of those. You said there were eight. I think you said eight. There were eight states that said no. They were all aircraft. Um, uh, two or three of them were f 35 all right, um, and either because of lawsuits or because the senator said no. When senators say no in my military career, and I'm sure the guys back here in the military, they always get what they want, always. Those are federal senators. Oh, federal, I'm sorry, not you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I bet congratulations. Yes, you're senators. Yes, you are. I'm sorry, the, the federal senator. Yeah, senators control the budget. They direct the military. The military works for civilians. And when the senators say, I want something or I don't something, in my career, 100% of the time they get what they want. Senator Leahy got us the F-35. Senator Leahy can get us any mission he wants. The Air Force never told us in their environmental impact statement anything about carrying nuclear weapons. A few of us in this room went through uh, documents that the Air Force had to provide because of our lawsuit. We were looking for other things, you know, 
maybe they did something inappropriately. We stumbled upon four references to nuclear weapons coming here. It, it took us by surprise, right? And by the way, hundreds of pages had been redacted. I think these slipped through. We then did some investigating, and that's when we found out about this document. So this took us by surprise. This was issued um, in February of 2018. I, I had no, I, you know, I put aside this job years ago when I retired. You know, nuclear war can really wear on you. Um, but when, when we learned about this, we did some investigating, and that's when we found out about it. Not because they told us, but because we stumbled upon it. We actually brought it to people's attention last year, but nobody paid attention to it. And then when it got more publicity, and then when the F-35s were definitely coming here, you know, we started to talk more about it, and here we are today. So it was a game changer, at least for So there are two kinds of uh, nuclear weapons that are launched from air breathers, which means heavy, uh, you know, heavy bombers, the B-52s, the B-2s, and now the F-35. They're called cruise missiles, and that's actually what Roger they were very imprecise, which is why they put a nuclear warhead on them, because they didn't think they could hit the, be the bears, the, that's the aircraft the Russians flew um, in. So because the weapons were imprecise, they put a nuclear-tipped uh, warhead on it, figuring the blast would blow the aircraft out of the air. Probably would have blown them out of the air, too. All right? We've gotten much more precise now, so we have things called cruise missiles, and they're guided. The bomb that they are designing for the F-35, called the B-62 Mod 12, that's going to be a guided. Um, so it's, it's going to be much more technological savvy than just a gravity bomb. So there are two types. You can drop a bomb, just plop, um, or you can you know, fire a cruise missile, a rocket, and that hones in using sophisticated technology to hit its target. So uh, uh, it's dual capable. It's called the DCA, dual capable aircraft. It's going to carry conventional weapons as well as nuclear weapons. No, it is designated as a dual capable mean, mean. And if you read through the administrative record where we found, you know, the Air Force said, it said every, every one of, of the, you know, the ones at the Vermont Guard in every place will have to train with all of the weapons they are eventually going to carry. You have to. Uh, and you can't wait until a catastrophe say, let's, let's try it now and see if it works. So, yeah. So my name is James Lease, and I'm going to talk about the legal part of this, uh, especially about war crimes. Now, according to the U.S. Department of Defense's own Law of War manual that was issued for the first time in 2015 and updated in 2016, war crimes are not restricted to where the shooting is going on in the theater of war. One way a war crime is committed is when civilians are harmed or when civilian property is damaged when there was no military objective at all or when the military objective is not necessary. It's a matter of choice. And that's precisely what we have here in Vermont. There's another way, there are several other ways you can have war crimes, and another one is when high value military equipment is located adjacent or intermingled with a heavily populated area or intermingled with civilians. This all comes right out of the Department of Defense Law of War Manual. I'm not making this up. Right. Vermont is very far removed from active theaters of war that the U.S. is now involved in. There are no enemy forces located around Vermont. And the 2013 Environmental Impact Statement that was put out by the Air Force identified five other better locations for basing the F-35 than in a city in Vermont. Those five others were remote from civilian population. The decision to base here in Vermont was a choice, not a military necessity. So harm to civilians is a war crime. Now, let's talk about the harm to civilians. 
and then we'll talk about the nuclear arm. The Air Force has thousands of families that live in the Chamberlain School neighborhood of the town I live in, South Burlington, in Winooski, which is in the flight path immediately after takeoff, same for Williston, and also parts of Burlington and Colchester are going to be harmed. The Air Force admits, for example, that children's learning can be impaired by the blasting noise that they're directly hit with from the day they're born, and also from multiple classroom interruptions in the seven schools identified by the Air Force. They named the schools. So they're going to have 10, 15, 20 classroom interruptions with blasting noise every Sorry, day. Yes, the, the blasting noise is just the sound From of the aircraft taking sound off. sound of the aircraft taking off and lesser noise when it's landing. But it's still very loud. The, and there's another problem. So classroom interruptions, blasting noise causes uh, learning impairment. And that's the, the data from that is mostly from much lower noise level aircraft, commercial aircraft. The F-35 is much, and the F-16, were much louder and are much more dangerous for children's learning. Now, there's another problem, and that's hearing damage. The Air Force gives much uh, pages of information about the hearing damage from this noise. They say that 114 decibels, which is the sound the Air Force says the F-35 will make as it's flying over Winooski, repeated exposure to noise at that level causes permanent hearing damage. And that is without the afterburner. That's by the time it reaches Winooski, the afterburner is off, even if they took off with the afterburner. But in South Burlington, in the Chamberlain School neighborhood, the F-35 is going to be using its afterburner, and it's going to be using it, according to the Air Force report, 5% of the time, or about 200 takeoffs per year. And that's going to be much, much louder than what we've experienced with the F-16, and it could cause immediate permanent hearing damage from one exposure. There's also the crash risk that you probably know about because unlike the F-16, the F-35 has a flammable body. It's a carbon composite body with a stealth coating. All of that burns in the fire when it crashes and thousand gallons of jet fuel catches on fire. The whole plane goes up in smoke, and that smoke is toxic because the carbon composite doesn't burn all the way to water and carbon dioxide. It has a slew of toxic carcinogenic and mutagenic fibers, particulates, and chemicals. And all of these dangers that I'm talking about are known, described, foreseeable. It's all in the Air Force report. But the harm is worse than all of this put together. And as we've heard, this nuclear bomb delivery system subjects our entire population I, uh, the seven towns just immediately around the airport add up to 126,000 people. That's a big fraction of the population of Vermont in those seven towns. And those people though, in those seven towns are going to be targeted. The nuclear bomb delivery ve vehicles are very high value targets and very legitimate military targets. Enemies of the US are going to be basing, are going to be targeting all the bases where all possible nuclear weapons can be launched. We have 4,000 passengers a day using that airport. It's a civilian airport. Those passengers, in addition to the 
uh, people living in the Chamberlain School neighborhood and in the neighboring towns in Winooski and Williston and so on will be targeted. And this is called, in the Law of War manual, human shielding. So it's illegal for the enemy to intermingle its military equipment and personnel with the civilian population. It's equally illegal for the US military forces to do the same thing. And that's what's happening here. Now, our state government depends on respect for the rule of law. So here we have an agency of our state government, the National Vermont National Guard, which reports to the governor. It's an agency of the state. It shouldn't be engaging in any kind of law breaking, much less the two kinds that I've talked about here where they're making people human shield and harming children and adults with learning impairment, hearing loss, and crash risk. Last March, in 2018, we had a vote, a town meeting vote in Burlington, without even knowing about the nuclear weapons capability and design of the F-35. The people of Burlington voted with more than 55% to cancel the F-35 basin in the airport Burlington owns. And then city councils in Winooski, South Burlington, and in Burlington joined the Burlington voters in making the request to cancel the F-35 and provide another mission that's compatible with location in a city. Fine, if you're going to be remote, maybe that wouldn't be a war crime. But here we're based in a city, surrounded, intermingled, adjacent, civilians, tens of thousands of civilians. Senate Resolution 5 provides a way for this committee and for the Senate as a whole to uphold the military's own law to protect the learning of children, to protect the health, safety, and property of Vermonters, and to respect the will of the people at town meeting. Thank you very much. So the other quick question would just be, we talked about Burlington being targeted, uh, and I haven't heard what that means in terms of uh, what kind of, uh, what the implications of Burlington being struck would be. Is that, an event for all of Vermont, or are we talking about Burlington? Not that it makes, I just would, I would like to understand better when people refer to it, what were implications? Well, the implications of Burlington being targeted, you're asking? Yes, if it were to Yes, be that has huge implications for Vermont, mm -hmm. because if you're talking about strategic nuclear strikes on airfields, they're done with very large weapons, and you know, you'll have effects depending on which way the wind is blowing, of course, will have effects well into Canada. So you're not just affecting Vermont, you might be affecting New York State, New Hampshire. You know, this is not you know, a little confined local matter that you know, maybe Burlington might get obliterated and the rest of Vermont will be fine, hardly at all. My name is Julie Masuga. Uh, and one year ago, we learned by accident that our home was about to be tar become the target of possible nuclear war, which sounds hyperbolic, but I assure you it is not. I spent last spring combing through tens of thousands of pages of heavily redacted documents that were made public through a lawsuit, internal emails between the Vermont Air National Guard, the Air Force, Congress, contractors, and even legislators like yourselves. We found corruption, violation of DOD regulations, and the straw that broke the camel's back, the question of nuclear weapons. I recall all too clearly reading a document to Colonel Greco at my kitchen table. It was titled Command Messages F-35A, and it was written by the Vermont Air National Guard. It lists out questions they hope they don't get. A red herring if I ever saw one. Question five reads, where are you planning on storing the nuclear weapons that are part of the F-35 arsenal? Colonel Greco was floored. She explained, with all the expertise that specializing in strategic intelligence and nuclear arms control affords a person, 
that we had bigger worries than noise and technological flaws. Vermont had painted a target on its back. The Air Force has recently stated that the F-35 is designed with a requirement to be compatible with nuclear weapons, and while we'll never know if nuclear weapons are stored here, it doesn't matter. The delivery system, the F-35, makes us a target as soon as they arrive here, just a few miles away from where I sleep. Our defenses are essentially a chain link fence. Not only that, but the F-35, unlike past aircraft, is manned by just one person. One person in Vermont's name could initiate a nuclear war, and I don't think our home is worth the risk. I will leave you with one more of our findings from the administrative record document number 58254. An Air Force public affairs person emailed Captain Gukin of VTANG, who wanted to know how to respond when folks ask about the F-35's nuclear role. The Air Force was uncertain, so VTANG responded, quote, I will work on a neutral statement for your review, just in case. A neutral response does not assure our safety unless the Air Force suddenly decides not to have any nuclear-capable F-35s, which seems unrealistic. Until then, we have a, paint, a target painted on our backs, so I ask you to please pass this resolution to protect us. Thank you. Um, my name is Beth Champagne. I would like also to bring up an issue which is painful because the senator I'm about to speak of, the senator in Washington, and you've just heard how when senators say what they want, they get it, is a distinguished person who's done a great deal of good, but, and you can all certainly tell me if you've heard otherwise, but I've heard for years that when the Air Force first looked for places to base the F-16, they had three rankings, green, yellow, red. And because the Vermont Air National Guard is right in the middle of such a highly populated area, it was rated red, the lowest possible rating. But, and again, anybody correct me who feels they know otherwise, Senator Leahy prevailed upon the military to choose Burlington the Vermont Air Guard for that. Um, I think that's probably enough. Thank you. Um, Thank you. My name is Richard Chaplinsky. Um, <clears throat> I am a veteran and I am president of Veterans for Peace. I'm an advisory member of the uh, organization and uh, I'm also on the board of the NRC, uh, uh, vice president of a local watershed group. I, I have um, quickly um, one specific, a couple specific things on the F-35s. This morning I was doing some research and I noticed that the next F-35 sightings are in Wisconsin and Alabama. One is uh, born in Wisconsin and it's going to be in Truex Air Force Base. It's in a rural area, a farmland, away from Madison. Looking at a map in Alabama, it's away from Montgomery, not a residential area. It's important to notice that because this decision probably was the wrong one. Uh, we've been working with the congressional delegation to uh, reverse their decision. We told them point blank, you have to reverse that decision. I'd like to make a bigger point, uh, and that is the connection between the huge military spending and climate change. There have been uh, Pentagon report saying that climate change is a national security crisis. The Watson Institute at Brown University did a study about the war spending over since 2011, uh, equivalent of six trillion dollars, and concluded that it is not sustainable and it is a national security concern. My point is, we have a huge military, and your Say $100 you spend for taxes when you pay them, about 65 goes to the military. That's humongous. I mean, it's the biggest in the nation, and some uh, countries don't have a military, Costa Rica, for example. So I think there's room, and we're a strong enough country that we could uh, be generous rather than uh, building up our military. Uh, and I think we need to take that. Uh, 
into consideration. So I urge you to pass the resolution, ask our Congress congressional delegation to reverse their decision. It's really important. Um, I think that's all. And uh, thank you for letting me testify. I'm Rachel Siegel. I live in Burlington, and I'm the director of the Peace and Justice Center. And the Peace and Justice Center started 40 years ago doing anti-nuke work, and we were part of the organizing that was referred to earlier um, in 1981 first on town meeting day, our great tradition, 17 towns declared themselves nuclear free. In 82, another 160 joined in, 177 towns and cities in Vermont declared themselves nuclear free zones. In 1982, 2,000 Vermonters went to New York City, which was the largest anti-nuke protest ever, and Vermont had the highest per capita participation of any state. Reagan listened at that time, started dismantling some weapons, and slowed down the arms race. The people of Vermont spoke, and we're speaking again. We don't want nuclear weapons and we don't want nuclear weapon delivery systems in our state. And it might sound really radical, it might sound really pie in the sky, but that's what it sounded like when people started talking about abolishing landmines. And we know what happened, they were abolished. And the same thing with biological weapons, and the same thing with chemical weapons, it absolutely can happen. It can, and it can start here. It was abolished with people power, and we can do it again. Vermont has had a history of speaking out against nuclear weapons, and this time it really could be the end. It could be the beginning of the end. Who knows? If not us, who? And if not now, when? Like, let's try. We don't need to shoot ourselves in the foot before we try. Vermont's been at the forefront of tremendous national change. We think of marriage equality. We think of health care reform. We've changed the course of politics outside of our state borders before through bold commitment to what is right, even when it seems implausible. Let's do that again. I would be so proud and so happy. Please let's send a clear message that we don't want these in Vermont. We don't want them anywhere. But we have more jurisdiction here than we have other places. It won't be quick and it won't be easy, but it has to start somewhere. And it could start with you all. I really, really hope that you'll pass this resolution and bring it to the full Senate for passage. And it was mentioned that we should talk about alternative missions, and the one that comes to mind for me is cybersecurity, because that's the thing that I, uh, my understanding is that's our biggest risk, is somebody could shut down our whole grid like that. And so if we had a cybersecurity mission working in Vermont, we actually could do some real good. 